All right. Praise the Lord. God bless you. I am uh, about to get started here. So I uh, want to give you all a couple of minutes uh, to come in and uh, just got the uh, Zoom set up. Uh, so let's uh, let's see what's happening here. Let's. Uh, all right. Uh, to come in. Hang on just a second. Let me mute that. All right. Good deal. Good deal. All right, so I am looking at two different screens here, so um, there may be a little bit of a delay in uh, my um, reaction, but I uh, see many of you on uh, Roshane, Isaac, uh, I see you, Monique, God bless you, Marlon, uh, uh, Madrick, God bless you, uh, Pastor Adwaters, uh, God bless you, Key Dawson, Grace Sage, Cameron Dukes, Gary Turner, so many of you, I see my dear sister Miko, uh, God bless you. God bless you. Cynthia uh, Magone, uh, bless you all tomorrow. Uh, God bless you. So uh, I wanted to wait. Uh, my apologies for um, getting on a little bit after uh, nine, uh, but I wanted to wait until after uh, Dr. Mason finished up. I, I did not know that he was going to be on, uh, but I uh, do believe uh, that um, what he was saying was very important uh, from an apologetic standpoint as he was talking about uh, Christians and Hebrew Israelites and uh, breaking down some scripture <clears throat> so that we could understand the law and the purpose of the law. So I wanted to wait until he was done. Uh, bless you, Nathan. God bless you. I see you. I see you. Ray Combs, uh, Pat O'Neill, so many of you uh, that are joining. Hit the share button. We're going to be talking about um, tarrying for the Holy Ghost. And uh, hit the share button uh, with as many people as, uh, uh, share it with as many people as you possibly can. Uh, I think this is a really important topic and it is based on a video that I saw yesterday. Actually, a couple of people showed it to me and um, I saw it again uh, a little earlier today uh, via inbox and um, had a discussion about some of the implications of the video and decided, you know what, I think it would be good for me to go on and utilize the video as a means to uh, address some of the theological implications. So I want to thank uh, uh, Tamara Lloyd actually for um, bringing it to uh, my attention again for a uh, second time. And uh, so um, yeah, continue to hit share uh, because we really want this to go out. Uh, we want as many people to uh, see it as possible. Uh, so here's what I'm going to do um, uh, while the numbers are building. I am going to play the video. Uh, it's uh, probably um, uh, a minute, uh, if that. And I'm going to play the video so that you could get a better sense of uh, what we're going to be talking about. And we're just we're going to examine the video, but we're going to examine it in light of scripture. We're going to talk about uh, the practice uh, uh, from a church cultural standpoint. Uh, we're going to look at what the Bible has to say, and uh, we're, we're going to uh, do a very fair treatment of this particular issue. Continue to hit share. Uh, let me um, share my screen, and I am going to play this video uh, so that you could see it. So give me, uh, uh, give me a second here. All right. Let me, there we go. Okay. I want to make sure you guys are seeing me. Is everybody seeing me? It, I want to make sure everybody is seeing it. Um, hang on one second. All right. Uh, let me know if you guys are seeing uh, that video uh, because I don't know if... Uh, no? Okay, hang on just a second.
Let's see if it comes up now. All right, so uh, hopefully you were able to um, view the video. And uh, so we're gonna talk about it. Uh, we wanna talk about what we, um, what we just saw. And uh, let's see. All right, good, 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 good. So the video did come up. There's a delay in what I am seeing on my main screen and what I am looking at in my Facebook Live. And so it looks like, um, there's a little bit of a lag there. So uh, I, again, forgive me, but I needed to be able to do that so I could see the comments. Uh, but nonetheless, um, let's talk about it. Let's talk about uh, tarrying for the Holy Ghost. Uh, so, so the first thing that I want to do is, uh, and continue to share the video. First thing I wanna do is uh, really a step, really situate this uh, within a historical context. Uh, so that everybody can understand what the practice is. Uh, so, so the practice is, um, it is a Pentecostal teaching, uh, if you will. Um, some people would call it a doctrine, others would just call it a, um, a practice. Uh, in, in many churches, they uh, will say that we don't believe in tarrying, uh, but in effect, what they actually do practice at the altar is in essence the same thing as tarrying. And uh, so what is tarrying? Well, uh, in uh, classical Pentecostal churches, as well as in the oneness Pentecostal churches, tarrying uh, is, is the view that the person seeking to be filled with the Holy Spirit, if you're a classical Pentecostal, uh, that idea is, is that you are a believer and you are seeking the baptism, which is in classical Pentecostal theology, a second experience. In oneness Pentecostal theology, it is salvation. And so you are then tarrying for the Holy Ghost. You are, in other words, you are tarrying to be saved. In either case, tarrying is seen to be waiting on the Holy Spirit. And, uh, and so there are Pentecostals who will say, well, we, we don't believe in tarrying because tarrying uh, means that, uh, you know, we're, we're waiting for the Holy Spirit's arrival. And since the Holy Spirit has already come, uh, we, are, we, we are just receiving the Holy Spirit. And, uh, and so that is an attempt to make a claim that they don't practice tarrying. But in effect, if you have anybody at an altar and you are coaching them into what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit, you could say a hundred times that you don't believe in tarrying, but tarrying is, is uh, it's not only associated with waiting, but within church cultural practice, it is the idea uh, that you are seeking for the Holy Spirit. And so seeking for the Holy Spirit uh, at a Pentecostal altar involves a lot of things. And, and so as we're going to break it down, what it involves is essentially working, right? So, so let, me, let me contextualize this for you. So the seeker of the Holy Spirit wants to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Again, if they're in a classical Pentecostal context, they 
are taught that they are already saved and they're getting a second blessing. This is a, a baptism, a coming upon, right? But if they're in the oneness setting, uh, this is a filling, this is salvation itself. In either case, both persons are put in a situation to where they become the seeker. And, and of course, for the most part, they're usually coached into what to expect. Uh, here's what happened in Acts chapter 2, and here's what happened in Acts chapter 10. Here's what happened in Acts chapter 19. You can expect that the same thing is going to happen to you in most cases, right? Uh, but typically what ends up happening is, is that the seeker uh, is usually then told to uh, raise their hands, whether they are on their knees or whether they're standing, raise your hands. And, uh, you know, just begin to offer him praise. And as you begin to offer the Lord praise, um, the Lord is going to come in and he's going to fill you, right? And, 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 and so in some Pentecostal tech context, like what we see in this video, those persons are taking literally the verse uh, in Acts chapter 2, as well as in Romans chapter 10, uh, where it says, uh, they that call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, right? So, so they literally believe that in calling on the name Jesus, that they are going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And so you'll see, I'm saying, Jesus, 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 Jesus. And you'll see people, as you see in this video, people clapping. Yeah, come on, praise them, praise them, praise them. Yeah, that's it, that's it, hallelujah, you know. And it's kind of like, you know, really pumping up the, 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 the atmosphere, so to speak, really creating uh, a uh, somewhat of a momentum, really creating a, uh, a crescendo, if you will, of, of uh, excitement and expectation, praise, uh, all of these different things. And so um, this person is, you know, and then they're usually down there also clapping and, you know, call his name, call him. And they'll be down there for a long time, you know, 30 minutes, an hour, uh, sometimes longer than that. And uh, if they're standing, oftentimes you will have persons who are uh, in either ear. Now, uh, one person is, is listening uh, for them to speak in tongues. And this person, depending upon which church you belong to, because again, churches have cultures, things that, you know, these are nuances and variations that belong to their particular local assembly. Uh, that are very similar to what you find elsewhere, but not necessarily the same. And so what you'll typically find at these kind of altars is a person listening. This person is an authenticator. They are uh, to verify and to confirm that the tongues that they hear uh, is the authentic sign that the Holy Spirit has arrived. Uh, I'm laying the foundation here. You'll see where I'm going here uh, in a minute. Uh, and, and, and so in West Indian cultures, like in uh, your um, Caribbean type churches, Jamaican churches, and uh, um, these kind of churches, uh, this process is called being passed. So this person passes you. In other words, they're like, yeah, they got it. They got it. Right. And, and that's kind of where that terminology comes from. You know, I got it. You know, there's even a song. I got it. I got it. I got it. I got it. Something about the power of the Holy Ghost. I can't explain it, but I got it. Right. So 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 part of the problem with this theology is this, it's it's uh, it is experience based. And what ends up happening from a pneumatological, a pneumatological standpoint is, is that the Holy Spirit becomes an experience. Uh, and is no longer seen as uh, a person in, in the divine sense. Uh, it becomes a, an experience to get. And so you hear terminologies like so-and-so caught the Holy Ghost, so-and-so got it. Uh, we have five got the Holy Ghost last night, five got it, you know, and all this other stuff, right? So, so, so the idea of this confirmer, this verifier, this passer, uh, this authenticator is to listen uh, to because somehow they they have some special discernment uh, in this culture. They've got some special discernment uh, whereby um, they can tell better than others in the congregation whether or not somebody's tongues are genuinely uh, given by the Lord or or, or what have you. And, and so uh, within that within that framework, you have. 
a lot of things that happen at the altar that constitutes working. And so you'll find at in these kinds of altars, you'll find persons who are oftentimes, they'll say, it, man, I've been on the altar for years. And what do they mean by that? In other words, I've been seeking for the, for the experience of the infilling or the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and I have not gotten it yet. And there are many people who walk away frustrated, so forth and so on, and, 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 and they haven't received it. And so in many of these instances, these persons would be told that, um, you, you, so, you know, they'll, you'll hear somebody say, you know, um, uh, we, we had two received the Holy Ghost and uh, a third person almost received it. So, so, I mean, the very notion of almost received salvation ought to tell you that that's not the gospel, but not in this kind of context, because again, their theology is really more informed by their culture, their church culture, more so than scripture. It, it, biblically, it is not possible to almost be saved. It, 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 you know, it is not possible to almost receive the Holy Spirit. Um, it, it, you understand what I'm saying? So, so the Bible says, uh, it, it was it Ephesians? Uh, 2, 8, and 9, it, for it is by grace through faith that we are saved, and that not of ourselves, for it is the gift of God and not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, so in this kind of context, what ends up happening uh, is, is that this person uh, who almost got it oftentimes are then told uh, that uh, you've got some barriers in your life. You've got some things uh, that need to be removed. Uh, Nadine, would you do me a favor? This, this light in here, would you turn it on? Uh, because the, the, the light is constantly dimming. If you would turn that light on for me. Uh, thank you, I, I appreciate it. Just kind of um, turn that light on, hit that switch. That way uh, it will, uh, there you go. Good, there we go. Because uh, I, I saw the light kind of dimming in and out. So, uh, so this person who almost gets it is told you've got a barrier in your life. Uh, you've got uh, some sin, perhaps. Uh, what you need to do is you need to fast. Um, well, there it is, it's still there. Well, you need to fast and uh, uh, two or three days and and then we'll come back and 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 we'll you know pray with you, uh, tarry with you or whatever uh, because God wants to remove that sin or whatever those barriers are. Maybe you have not fully surrendered. And so fasting will kind of help you with that. Now there are people who say, oh no, well, brother, we don't teach that. Well, maybe you don't, but there are lots of others who did. And I'm going to tell you, I worked Pentecostal altars for over 20 something years. And I even taught seminars on working Pentecostal altars. So trust me when I tell you, even if that doesn't happen at your church, it still happens at many, many other Pentecostal churches. This is some of the idea that you'll hear. So you'll hear people who are told, here's what you need to do. Here's my point. Anytime you are told, here's what you need to do in order to A, either posture yourself for the Holy Spirit. You want to get comfortable. Uh, some people will say you want to get down on your knees. Some people will say you want to just sit in a chair, just relax and all that other stuff. You see, if, if salvation is really of God, from whence cometh all of this coaching on what a person needs to do in order to prepare themselves for something that they cannot earn anyway? Do you see my point? My, my point is, is that the Bible tells us directionally that salvation comes from God. It is not predicated on 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 how you prepare your heart to receive him see here's why i know that because no man comes to the father except he first be drawn so everything from a salvific standpoint that is from election all the way up to the point in time when you are regenerated all of that was god pulling you towards himself even towards receiving and hearing the gospel with a receptive heart uh, when you uh, placed faith in his son Jesus all of that was given to you for it uh, uh, the Bible tells us that that God gives to every man a measure of faith so this is saving faith this is not something that you produced on your own this is not something that God said well here's what you need to bring to the to the table this is something that he gives you 
So that when you come to the table, as he pulls you to the table, that you already have because he already gave it to you. So the repentance is produced in your heart. The faith is given to you. The conviction is wrought by the Holy Spirit. All of these things are the work of God, right? And so it is not biblical to teach people uh, that they must posture themselves to receive the regeneration, the outpouring, the infilling, the baptism of, with, or in the Holy Spirit. All of those are synonymous terms for salvation. And, and, and so tarrying is this idea that you have got to do something. Now, somebody will say, well, preacher, um, wh where does that idea come from? Where do they get this idea from? Well, the idea itself comes from, um, it comes from their interpretation of Jesus's own words. And so you'll find uh, in the gospel of Luke chapter 24, you'll also find in Luke's second uh, volume, uh, which is the book of Acts, uh, you will find uh, that uh, Jesus said that they should go and wait in Jerusalem until they are clothed or endued with power from on high. And in Acts chapter one, you hear Jesus repeat the very same thing, uh, that they are to go and wait for the promise of the Father. Uh, and he said, as, as you have heard of me before, uh, you've heard me say it when John was baptizing. And John even said the one coming after is going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. He says, you're going to go and wait in Jerusalem until you are until you receive the promise of the father and until you are uh, endowed with this power from on high. So the idea that they were to go to Jerusalem. And uh, they were they were to uh, leave the uh, Mount of Olives uh, where Jesus ascended and they were to go into Jerusalem from there and they were to wait there. Right now, that's all they were told. Just wait. They were not told on what day they were not told exactly when they were told to just wait. So this idea of waiting, uh, you know, waiting on God uh, to pour out his spirit. So you'll, you'll hear people who are on the altar for a long time. Well, you know, it's going to come in God's own time. You know, when, when, when people start getting exasperated and tired, he, he's going to do it in, in, his, in his own time, in his own time. And so let's contextualize what happened there uh, in Acts chapter one and Acts chapter two so that people can understand that this whole notion of tarrying uh, is a uh, was fulfilled historically. And so the first myth that we need to address is in 2 and 1, Acts 2 and 1. Uh, and when the day of Pentecost uh, had fully come or had fully arrived, uh, in, in fact, the, the Greek word there, uh, uh, the, I think it's suplarimostai, uh, suplarimostai is the, is the Greek word there. But that word means when the day was arriving. That is when the day was arriving. And so, of course, when we look in the text, we find out that it was just before nine o'clock in the morning. So it was very early. So, so Luke says, and when the day was arriving, um, it, it, uh, or when the day of Pentecost was fully come, um, um, it, the, the text tells us uh, that um, suddenly, when it was arriving, suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and filled all the house where they were sitting and uh, there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as fire. This is the King James version of it. Uh, that sat upon each of them and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And, and, and so part of understanding why Luke wrote it in this way is to really start uh, engaging uh, midrashically uh, with the Jewish literature. Uh, and so not only extra biblical literature, but just with the text itself. And so when we go back to Exodus 19, we find, of course, that um, Pentecost or Shavuot in the Hebrew, uh, that in the very first Shavuot, which was 50 days after uh, the uh, first Pesach or the first Passover, God delivering them out of Egypt, 50 days after that, God came down upon the mountain of Sinai in the morning uh, and gave Moses the law. And, and, and so um, God had been telling the prophets, and I'm going to 
put, I'm going to put the law, I'm going to write it on the inside of your heart. I'm going to give you a new heart, so forth and so on. So the, the uh, outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit uh, at the birth of the church is a, it is a new Sinai. It, it, is, a, uh, it is a new giving, uh, but, but, but this giving is not of the Torah. It is of the Holy Spirit who is, who is going to bring the Torah into the heart of of God's people. And so Luke interacts with a lot of the language that Moses uses um, in uh, Exodus 19. And then, of course, when you read the, the, the uh, rabbinic writings, whether it is the Mishnah or the Babylonian Talmud, um, you'll find that they talk about all of the same things that Luke described, such as uh, flashes of fire. Uh, the rabbi said that uh, there were 70 languages that were being spoken at Mount Sinai and that these languages could be seen. And they get the number 70 because 70 was the number for the nations. It was a symbolic number uh, for the nations. And so the rabbi said that God literally, Yahweh literally spoke the Torah in every human language. And uh, one, of the, uh, one of the extra biblical resources, uh, one of the rabbinic resources says that those words, they could literally see the Torah words, they could literally see the letters and those letters were ablaze as fire was shooting forth from the mountain. And so you could see Luke really interacting with this, um, with, with, with this conceptual reality that Jews already had in their mind about what took place with their early ancestors when the baptism of the Holy Spirit was giving. Now, why am I saying all that? Here's why I'm saying that, and this is what I want you to understand. And, and let, me, let me correct some theology here. Nothing that the 120 did on that day brought about or brought on the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. See, because people will say, and when the, when the day had fully come, they were all in one place in one accord. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and suddenly, as though what happened was uh, uh, contingent on their praying. And, and so many of the earlier revivals, whether you want to talk about the Welsh revival and all these revivals that preceded Pentecost Pentecostalism, there was already set in place a, a, an Arminian uh, Wesleyan Methodist kind of theology that, that began to teach people about entire sanctification and looking for greater experiences to complete sanctification, right? And, and, and so revivals were predicated on praying and through the course of prayer, God would send that second experience or that second work of grace. And so these revivals were predicated on this idea that God would do it again, but he's gonna do it in the context of prayer. You gotta, we've gotta wait on him, we've gotta wait on him. And so you see that in, uh, the, in, in, in Charles Parham's um, Bible colleges, the students would pray um, in Topeka, Kansas and Houston, Texas. And then of course on Bonnie Bray Street in Los Angeles. And then when that cottage, uh, uh, when, when they had outgrown that cottage, they moved it over to uh, Azusa Street, an old livery stable that they had converted. And what were they doing? They were praying for the experience to come because their reading of Acts chapter two lended itself to the idea that what God did in Acts chapter two, verse one, was predicated on, on a unified prayer meeting that brought about the reality of God. Now, here's why that is wrong. It is wrong because number one, the Bible says that Jesus had told them to go and wait until you receive the promise of the Father. So the Father had already promised to send the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 14, Jesus says that he's going away to prepare a place. That place that he was going away to was Calvary. And he says, and because I go there, he says, my father and I are going to make our Monet in the Greek, our dwelling, our house with you. And the father is going to send the Holy Spirit and he is going to indwell you also. Right. So, so this was already promised. Now, God knew that the promise had a day where in, in which he was going to send it. 
but none of the apostles knew what day it was going to be received. And so this is very similar to what we find there in Galatians 4, uh, verse 2 and 4 and 4. Um, Paul talks about, of course, God sending tutors, which is the law, until the time appointed by the Father. This is what the text says. Then in verse 4, it says that when the fullness of time, uh, pleru is the Greek word there. And so you can see that pleru or fullness is, is the lemma that you find, the core lemma that you find even in Acts 2 and 1. And so what Paul is essentially saying is, is, is that God had appointed a time. And when that time was fully complete, when it was fully complete in his own sovereign purpose and will, he said, I'm going to send forth my son at this time. And so what I'm saying is, is that nobody could have massaged, nobody could have manipulated, nobody could have done anything that could have brought on God sending forth his son. That was done according to the, the, the counsel of God's own will. And so God had already planned to, to do, to send the Holy Spirit on the day of Shavuot as he had planned. He only told them to wait. Nothing about their waiting contributed to what happened when the Holy Spirit came. So it didn't matter whether they were asleep, didn't matter whether they were praying, didn't matter what they were doing. They could have been having a, a discussion. The Holy Spirit came when God determined that it would come. And he didn't determine it on that day. It had already been determined. And this is why Jesus told them, you're going to go and just wait on the promise of the Father, right? And, and so here, why am I saying all this? I'm saying all of this because if nothing that they could have done to receive the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, how does anybody think that they can tarry or they can put themselves in a posture, whether it is prayer, whether it is praise, uh, wh whether it is singing or anything. How do you think that you can put yourself in a posture to receive something that comes from the will of God? It comes from God's own will and purpose, his own sovereign will, not something that you encourage through something that you do. In fact, as soon as you begin to think in that way, you are already undermining the gospel. You are already undermining the fact that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. As soon as you teach, teach somebody about a posture, uh, a position, uh, something that they must do, uh, say it faster. Jesus, 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 loose your tongue, loose your tongue. Well, well, listen, anything that you say repetitively over and over and over, uh, you keep going and it's no longer going to sound like English. And yet there are many people who claim that this is, that was the, the premise upon which they began to even speak in tongues. In fact, when the video was originally posted, uh, the young man that posted the video said, this is how I got it. This is how I got it. And, 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 and so my response to that is, nobody working to receive salvation has received salvation if the Bible is true. Now, if the Bible is not true, then, then perhaps you might be right, right? But, but that would be an oxymoron, because then what would salvation be if the Bible is not true? And so let God be true and let every man then be a liar. Nobody got anything from tarrying. No, nobody ever worked for something called salvation and got it through working. The Bible says it is by grace through faith and not of works. So if you were down there, Jesus, 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 you are working, my friend. And God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath not God said it? Shall not he do it? Hath not he spoken it? Shall not he bring it to pass? And what I am telling you, my friend, is, is that it is not possible for a person to, I don't care how they have been taught, to, to be calling to Jesus, 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 or, or, or whatever you are doing, whether you have been told to stand up and lift your hands or sit down and get relaxed or just, just, just do this or do the other. 
Anytime you have to be instructed and coached into what you must do fast and get your heart right, come back next Sunday and we'll go at it again. Anytime you must be coached into receiving the gift of salvation, you, my friend, have not received salvation. You have received a cultural experience that you have been coached into. And, 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 and so whatever it is that you receive, it's not biblical is my point, because that is not what we find in scripture. We do not find people working to receive anything. That the apostles, in fact, the Bible says in Acts chapter one, that they would go uh, into the temple colonnade area and, and they would pray there every day. But it was not their prayer that brought on the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It was not them being united and them being together and on one accord or any of that. The Holy Spirit came because God sent it as he had promised at a time when he had planned for them to receive it. And, 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 and so this whole notion of tarrying is predicated on a salvation by works construct. Now, I know there are some folks who will, will, will not want to hear this of what I am saying, that there are some people who may get mad and all these other things. Uh, God bless you. Keep getting mad uh, because if you keep listening long enough to the gospel, perhaps God is going to use the gospel to break down those theological strongholds in your mind. And at some point in time, you might be willing to be ready then to accept the truth. But here's the truth, whether you want to accept it or not. Tarrying, and, and, and again, there are some people who say, well, that, we don't call, we don't believe in tarrying. But doesn't matter whether you don't call it that. If you have people at the altar and you are taking them through various exercises in order to receive the Holy Spirit, it's the same thing as tarrying, even if it's by another name. If you are practicing that, my friend, you are undermining the gospel in practice because the gospel is very explicit and very clear that salvation does not come by works. That is by the contribution of men. There's nothing you can do to put yourself in the position to receive that. I hope that I'm really making myself clear and I'm really driving that point home as, as strongly as possible. And so let's look at the video again. Well, we won't look at the, uh, the literal video, but just to discuss the video a little bit more. So what do you have here in this video? And again, um, I am not saying that Pentecostal people are not saved or any of that. I am not even denigrating uh, Pentecostal believers. I am examining a theological practice uh, or practice that comes out of a theology uh, that that actually does undermine the scripture. And so you could see in this particular uh, church, and, and, and again, many Pentecostal charismatic churches today are not as old fashioned as this. But again, it doesn't matter what kind of methodology, once they start coaching people, they're doing the same thing, just in a different package. That's all, just a different face on it. So, so this is an older face. This is an older template right here, right? So in this particular template, you can see that chairs have been put out. You can see that newspaper has been put out because in this particular template, people are encouraged uh, to uh, literally slob and spit. You know, uh, uh, there, there was a uh, the, some of the earlier Pentecostals and even before the Pentecostals, the fire baptized holiness movements that had come out of Methodism had taught that when the Holy Spirit comes, this, this, this sanctifi sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit comes, that he's going to purge us. And, and, and so in some of those fire baptized holiness type churches, a lot of these storefront kind of churches, you would find this kind of element there where people were being encouraged to, to slob and spit, hence the newspapers. So when Pentecostalism comes around uh, in 19. Uh, uh, 1904 to 1906, you find them essentially tack on uh, fire baptized holiness Methodist kind of theology 
to this experience. And so what came along with that package was a lot of the things that many of those earlier groups were already practicing. And that was this whole notion of, you know, really purging and this, that, and the other, and, and getting down, calling on his name, call on him, call. And, and so you could see, so songs would be sung. You can see people clapping. And it's almost like the equivalent of working up a lather. It, it, now, now, this might sound very, very foreign to many people who uh, maybe you are from very strict Baptistic type uh, churches or whatever. You've never heard of this stuff before. But in reality, what they are doing in essence is working up a rhythm, working up a, a lather, working up a crescendo of what they think God is going to ride in on. And when we can really lather up enough, you know, and, and, and it, there's a there's a strong rhythm that that comes along with the, the clapping and the singing and the and the call his name, call it. And then as it starts getting real good, that's it. That's it. You know, and it's almost like you're getting closer. You're getting closer. That's it. That's it. You're almost there. You're almost there. How, how could that be from a biblical standpoint? How, how could that be? Literally, how how is that even possible? from a biblical standpoint? How could you be getting closer? How could you almost be there? How could you work up a, a lather and the rhythm and the crescendo upon which, you know, at, at the very peak and the pinnacle of a, of a particular moment after you have really lathered up enough calling on his name and enough praise that he comes in at that moment. That, that's, not, that's not God orchestrating by his own will that would be God essentially coming in on the contingency that you have done enough. And when you have done enough, then I'll come in. Is that what we find in the Bible, my friends? Is, is that what we find in the scripture? No, we don't find anything like that. But that idea is completely foreign to what we find in the word of God. This is completely foreign to scripture, but yet it is a part of, and again, Swap this out, give it another face, and and just and and, and work that same lather up through singing, uh, 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 um, through singing, um, he is holy, or 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 welcome into this place, uh, or or um, what, whatever you know, set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. I want more of you, God. Sing that for about 15, 20 minutes, or thirty minutes, or an hour. At the end of the day, no matter how you swap out the face of this, when you encourage people to seek for the free gift of salvation, that is to go after it, which involves work, which involves something you must do. Now, somebody's saying, I don't believe that. Well, then please tell me why folks are down rolling their sleeves up at the altar, getting all sweaty laying on the ground, some folks hitting the ground. Call on them, son, call on them. I mean, listen, if that is not work, I would really like to understand from you how you define working. Did you know this, that the attire of the priest in tabernacle service, in the book of, in, in the book of Leviticus, I can't remember which chapter, uh, but uh, you guys can fact check it uh, in terms of chapter and verse. Uh, but in the book of Leviticus, uh, I believe it might be, um, no, it's not Leviticus. It, it is Deuteronomy. I believe it is either Deuteronomy 22 or 25. But in Deuteronomy, God forbids the priest from wearing mixed garments. So a lot of people have read that and they thought that that was a mitzvot or a commandment for everybody. No, no, no. It was a mitzvot for the priest. And specifically, it said that they were not to mix linen and wool. Now, you may have never understood why God gives this particular uh, mitzvah. Well, mixing for one uh, typically meant that uh, something was in, 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 a, in a construct of, of, of holiness or kosher. Mixing things generally tended towards something wrong, right? So in the mixing of wool and linen, the, 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 the priests were supposed to wear all linen garments. Now, one of the reasons that they were supposed to wear white linen garments, obviously, was to symbolize, obviously, the righteousness, tip of the righteousness of God, which was later fulfilled in Christ. But why is it linen? I'm going to tell you why it's linen. Because linen, linen 
Uh, it was very light and, uh, and it, it, it wasn't heavy and therefore it would not generate uh, perspiration. And so perspiration was not good. Wool, however, was hot and wool would bring on perspiration. God did not even want when the priests were working for the appearance of perspiration to, to, to uh, uh, for, a, I should say, for sweating or perspiration to occur, which would indicate that salvation was somehow being worked for. Sweating or the sweat of the brow, we could see that in Genesis chapter three, uh, was, uh, was a byproduct of the curse, if you will. Now, not saying that working is, is, is in, of, in and of itself a curse, but labor, the earth fighting back, and, and, and all the things that we've got to labor against uh, that really produces uh, labor hardships and all these different things. Sweating symbolizes the hardship of labor, because of course, when you're working hard at anything, you will produce a sweat. Sweating, however, was typified in tabernacle typology uh, as, as work. And so God did not want them wearing garments that would suggest that what they were doing, which was redemptive in nature, is earned by the work of man. It was wrought by work, but not the work of men, the work of God's son, Jesus Christ. It is he alone that accomplished uh, atonement and, 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 and paid the price for our sins through his work at the cross. And so, so he's the only one that, that, that gets to work. You don't get to work. And when you work, you are insulting the father, insulting the son, and the Holy Spirit, because the three persons of the Trinity have all worked to bring salvation to you. The Father has decreed that you will be saved. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit went about bringing conviction, drawing you to the Father. The Son incarnated, went to the cross, lived 33 years perfectly, went to the cross, died for the sins of the world, and, and then ascended back into heaven, sent the Holy Spirit to bring the gift of salvation into the hearts of those whom he had elected as a result of having paid for it at the cross. And, and so when you work for salvation, you are insulting the, the Godhead. You are insulting the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit by suggesting that their work was insufficient here. Let me add to it. Let me just call on them a little bit more. Let me call on them a little bit louder. Let me lift my hands a little bit higher. Let me a little, as the song said, a little higher than before. And let me jump. Let me, oh, you know, you see folks emotionally start getting carried away and people start thinking, oh, they're getting close. They're getting close. All of that, my friends, undermine the gospel of Jesus Christ. Nobody almost got salvation. No, nobody is close to receiving it. That just doesn't happen in scripture. You either receive salvation or you don't receive salvation, but you don't almost receive it. And so in the context of getting the Holy Ghost, in this kind of culture, you can almost get it by not receiving it there, but doing all of the things that really brought you to the tipping point, that really brought you right to the edge whereby under most circumstances, other people who were right there, they received it too. And that lets us know that you are not, you, you are almost there. And, and so we've got to address some things. Maybe you've got some unconfessed sin in your life. See, anytime you think that you've got to do something to prepare your own heart for God to come in, you've already insulted the cross. You've already undermined the gospel. Now, maybe you don't know that that's what you were doing, but that's why I am here today. That is why I am doing this video, to, to clarify the implications of tarrying theology for, for people who don't understand why this is not the gospel. This is just not biblical. And, and, and for those folks 
who want to say, well, well, uh, you know, the old saints that, you know, that's how some of them got it. Either, either if, if that is true, then the Bible is wrong, but you cannot have it both ways, my friend. Nobody can work for salvation and get salvation through their work. If they did, it's not salvation that they received. And, and, and at some point, you who are resisting are going to have to surrender to that truth because salvation was accomplished by the work of God alone, particularly through the Son. And, 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 and when you receive it, it is because he has sent the Holy Spirit into our hearts, not because we have tarried long enough and done all of the things that we have been instructed to do in order to ready ourselves for it. Does, does that make sense? So, so um, let me, um, let me, uh, I, am, I am not in the comment section, so I can only imagine the comment section uh, is on fire. Um, so let me uh, let me go in and take um, uh, take some some questions uh, with regard to um, tarrying. All right. So I am I am all the way down at the bottom of the screen. If you have asked a question before, uh, I'm not going to be able to scroll up and see it. Uh, so I am going to ask that you uh, type that question in again. Uh, uh, what I'm seeing here, I see a comment by Kevin, uh, uh, my brother. Uh, we cheapen the work of Jesus when we attempt to work for what he freely gave. So that's where I am um, at this point. So I see uh, my dear sister, Angel Holcomb saying, uh, ha ha, it's lit. So that's what I am seeing. So uh, if you type your question in, uh, I will see it shortly. And uh, if I don't see it, uh, it, it's again, it's just a little bit of a delay. Give me a, give me some time, but I want to answer questions that you might have with as it relates to um, this altar culture, this altar kind of theology that includes tarrying, even if it is not necessarily called that. All right. Uh, so so um, Simone Hudson Bernard is asking the question, what are your views on tongues as the evidence? Uh, that we receive the Holy Ghost. So uh, let me answer that real quickly in two ways. Number one, uh, I have a video. Uh, I've got, uh, hang on. Uh-oh, my alarm went off. So I've got several videos actually that address that. One of them, I believe um, last week, I talked about the two weeks ago, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Uh, I've got another one that talks about tongues. You can find these uh, not only on my Facebook page, but you can also find it uh, on my YouTube channel, Urban Logia uh, Ministries, where I go into a complete breakdown in, in, in much the same way that I did tonight, where I'm actually talking about that. But in short, uh, the answer to that question is no. Uh, and so, so, so uh, the, the evidence that a person has received salvation is first of all, it would be improper to even say evidence. There are evidences, ev evidences of a person who is born again. Uh, number one, Jesus says, you'll know them by the fruit that they bear. So that's part of that evidence. Um, the Bible says, you'll know that they have passed from death unto life by the fellowship and by the love that they have uh, for their brothers and their sisters. And that love obviously is characterized by the sacrificial love of Jesus. So we're not just talking about any kind of love, right? So, so, um, so again, the evidence is that a person has been born again uh, is not only their own confession of faith, uh, but two, there is an ontological internal evidence. Uh, Romans chapter eight, Paul says that the Holy Spirit will bear witness with our spirit, not, not with some pastor or some authenticator standing on the outside of you but he will bear witness with your spirit that you are sons of God, whereby we cry out in our hearts, Abba, Father, right? So, so, so that is another evidence. Well, from an external phenomenological standpoint, other believers begin to see that you are demonstrating or, or uh, that is you are literally walking out the evidence of a spirit-filled uh, Christ-centered uh, 
uh, Christ-filled life, and 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 that is uh, that you those fruit are actually the characteristics or the qualities, the characteristics, the attributes of Christ himself. And so Galatians uh, 5 calls it the fruit of the spirit, right? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, uh, uh, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, self-control, so forth and so on. So all these are, are evidences, right? So, so, so again, but, but what brings about salvation is, is the real question on the table. It is by grace through faith. And so when a person genuinely and authentically is, is, is led of God, moved of the Holy Spirit, made alive, quickened by the regenerative work of the Holy Spirit, what is produced in that person is repentance and in faith. Now, I'm not saying what happens sequentially. I'm saying from a logical order, uh, regeneration, faith, repentance, justification, uh, all those things happen in that moment. They don't happen in separate moments. They happen uh, in that same moment. Uh, Nadine, Nadine, hang on just a second. Uh, I hope that my wife is watching because my uh, I forgot to plug in. Uh, my battery may die. Nadine, uh, if somebody knows my wife's number, please give her a call so she can bring my charger. <laughs> I think my charger is uh, nearby. Um, so we'll get it plugged in. Uh, hopefully not before it. All right. Uh, my uh, backpack is right over there. I just need the uh, charger so that I can plug in. Um, <laughs> she says she's cooking goat for all of you Jamaicans. If you want to uh, send in uh, an order of uh, of um, curry goat uh, and uh, pea, rice and peas, um, if you want to send your order in, <laughs> I'm just playing. <laughs> Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Uh, there you go, there you go, there you go. All right, hang on just a second. All right, all right, hang on, hang on just a second. Give me one second. Because if I don't plug in, we will, we will, uh, we won't make it. All right, so uh, let's look at, let's look at another question here. Just one second. Good. We are back. All right. So uh, let's let's look at some of the other questions um, really quickly. Um, Shauna Michelle Hackworth asked a good question. She said, uh, do you believe that speaking in tongues is uh, for today? Um, uh, again, I do have that video on that, so I don't want to spend a whole lot of time answering tongues-related questions. But let me say this. Uh, it is a mistake to equate um, the supernatural experience of languages, as it were um, in Acts chapter 2, Acts 10, Acts 19. Uh, it is a mistake to equate that with the person of the Holy Spirit himself. The Holy Spirit and the phenomenon of languages are not one and the same thing. And, and, and so uh, God fulfilled Acts 1 and 8 by using uh, languages in a supernatural dispensation to confirm and to inaugurate uh, the, the birth of the church and the preaching of the gospel. Now, am I saying that... Um, that God cannot somehow use tongues uh, ever again. Uh, no, I'm not saying that at all, but I will say this, that if he does, um, it would be a very, very rare thing and it would be very non-normative. Now somebody said, oh, what do you mean by non-normative? Well, first of all, the supernatural um, languages in the Bible was non-normative. The first time you see it is in Acts chapter two, and the next time you see it is Acts chapter 10, and so I can help you do the calculation, that was 20 years later. So you, you don't find it in between that. And then you find it again in Acts chapter, um, Acts chapter 19. 
And, and so it was always non-normative, always non-normative. And so again, if, if tongues have continued in some rare and exceptional way, God can decide sovereignly to do that, well, then certainly he can. But we should not expect that it would work, operate, function any way differently than it did in the Bible. And that is, is that men were speaking languages that they had not learned by the supernatural power of God in order to convince the unbelief of men who did understand that language in their own ability, in their own natural ability, because it was their own natural tongue. And, and so if tongues have continued today, well, it, it better look like that. And I don't care how rare the language is, there had better be folks present who know that language or else you don't have that same phenomenon is, is, is the point. And, and, so, and so sure, it, it's very possible that God could use it again, but again, it would be just as non-normative if not more rare than it was then because we at least know theologically why God was utilizing it uh, in, in the book of Acts, Acts one and eight. And you should be witnesses unto me, both Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. And each time that we find that particular phenomenon in the book of Acts, it was in fulfillment of um, that particular uh, verse there. Uh, so uh, somebody said, Don Anderson, how did you get filled, sir? By doing exactly what the Bible says, and that is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Filling, salvation, regeneration, born again, all of those are the same thing. And, and there's nobody that gets it differently from anybody else. Everybody is saved the same way. Number one, by the same savior. Two, placing the same faith in the same person. Three, it's all brought about by the same grace of God. There's no changing in that. And, and, and furthermore, the moment of salvation as it comes into the heart of a person is a mysterious moment. And, and, and where people's theology starts going uh, extreme right or left is when they want to construct a theology that allows them to put their finger on the moment that that occurs. And so what you end up with extreme right is this tarrying kind of stuff. But then when you go extreme left, you end up with easy believism. And, and, and that is people who think that they can put their finger on the moment it occurs. And what I'm saying is, is we've got to, we've got to, it, it's, 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 see, it's not for me to determine the moment that it occurred in you. The Holy Spirit confirms within the believer that it has occurred within them. And sometimes they are made aware of it themselves. Uh, over time. But the reality is, is, is that one thing that they do know that happened, and that is, is, is that according to scripture, they were saved by grace through faith. That, that's, the, that's what salvation, that's how people get saved, by grace through faith. That's it, by grace through faith. Somebody says, oh, I don't know about that. Uh, it, it's got to be more than that. And that's exactly why you don't believe in the biblical gospel. Because as soon as you add something else to that, it is no longer the gospel of grace. That is what I want to drive home. You either believe the biblical gospel or you do not. Let me warn you that what Paul says about the gos other gospels, which he says are not truly other gospels. He says, if any man believes or any of you believe any other gospel other than that which we have preached. Why did Paul say that with such authority? Uh, John chapter 17, Jesus said, I pray not for them only. Uh, uh, I pray not for you only, rather. But I also pray for them who would believe on me through your words, that is through your logion, through your teaching, right? And so, so, so the apostolic witness of who Jesus is and what Jesus did is what we need to believe in order to be saved. And Paul says, if you don't believe that, but you believe something else, then you're not truly saved. In fact, he says, let that man be anathema maranatha. Let that man be accursed when the Lord comes. So, so, so at some point, uh, folks have got to really look at the gravity of this situation 
and start assessing and taking inventory of what they have believed. And they need to really start thinking long and strong about whether or not you have embraced and believed a false gospel. Because a false gospel will not get you saved. You see? So, uh, and I'm praying, I am praying as a result of this teaching tonight that many people come into the knowledge of the truth and, and be saved and be set free. Um, uh, let's see, um, what else do we have? I just wanna make sure, uh, I, I, I'm not, I see Don wants to uh, debate uh, and, and no, we, we'll, let's move on to uh, somebody else. Um, let's see. Um, what other, what other questions you have? I got to try and catch up to where I see a whole lot of stuff has transpired here. I'm way behind. Uh, okay. Let's see. All right. Well, well, Don, if it doesn't make sense, uh, God bless you, sir. Uh, you know, this is just not the platform to uh, to debate something that you don't understand. We understand it, right? So so if you don't understand, then let's just uh, allow the others who are here uh, to continue to listen. Um, and uh, perhaps you and I can have a, another conversation at another time, uh, or you can have another conversation with somebody else that might be willing to uh, take you up on that. But, but right now is not the time uh, for, for uh, uh, for debating, because this is not a debate. This is, this is a teaching. We are clarifying what is already biblically true. We are not trying to determine whether it is true. We know it is true because we have the assurance through the word of God. And, and, and so uh, if folks don't believe that, they do so to the peril and the danger of their own soul. And, and, and so we are not going to involve ourselves uh, with... Um, uh, with going back and forth on something that the gospel, uh, that the Bible has already made clear in the gospel. Uh, but I just want to clarify some things so that people can learn uh, and, 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 and be clear when they see things like this and they see people talking about, I got it, this is how I got it, that this person is biblically ignorant because nobody gets saved by working. That's a fact. And uh, uh, so, uh, so I, 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 so I need to see a lot of people asking questions about uh, uh, the difference between salvation and being filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, those were addressed on other videos. Um, we, uh, baptism with the Holy Ghost, baptism in the Holy Ghost, filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, I did an entire video talking about whether or, whether or not those things are the same or different experiences. And so if somebody could post that up uh, for my dear brother, uh, uh, Demetrius Warren, uh, who asked that question, uh, it would be good if you took some time to watch that because a lot of those particular issues we've already covered in, in other videos. And so a lot of people are asking those same kind of questions there um, uh, uh, about whether you get saved first and get the Holy Ghost later. We, 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 we've covered that in that other video. So I don't want to use this video to, to constantly say what, what has already been said uh, and well covered, well explained uh, during another, another video. Uh, but please watch that. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, anybody else, anybody else uh, with, with um, any, any other questions regarding the tarrying piece. So I'm all the way at the bottom now so I can see any questions uh, that you might be asking. Uh, anybody else? Yeah, Cordell and Demetrius, check out that link. Uh, I think somebody has posted it a couple of times already. Uh, but if you even go to my page, uh, maybe five or six posts uh, from, from the top, you might see it. Uh, you might see it there. Anybody else? Any? Uh, uh, M. Vance Madrick II asks a question, how are they saved when their pneumatological theology uh, is uh, erroneous? And, uh, and, and, and so, <clears throat> uh, you know, and, and, and this is where 
we've got to all tread lightly. There, there are some people who are in theological error, uh, but they did place genuine, authentic, uh, God-inspired faith in Christ. And as a result of that, they are saved. As a result of false teaching, they are in error. But the salvation occurred before the error occurred. And so by virtue of the fact that they have been indwelled or filled with the Holy Spirit, because they have believed in Jesus and have been therefore justified by faith. The Holy Spirit promises that he will guide believers into all truth. And so there are many people who are truly saved in various margins of error theologically, who we can expect will come out over some time because the Holy Spirit, who is the spirit of truth, lives in them. And he did not say, I might guide them or I can guide them. Jesus says, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide them into all truth. Now, there are some people who are just in gross theological error that is so heretical and heterodox to the faith that those persons simply are not saved. This would include folks who have simply believed on a different Jesus, uh, uh, an entirely different gospel altogether, right? So, 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 you know, so we want to tread lightly in terms of who particularly is saved versus who is not in, in, with regard to that, uh, is, 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 is that the light of the gospel all it takes is a ray of that light to shine through uh, and open the blinded minds of those who don't believe. That's what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 10. He says, in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them who believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. And so all it takes is just the light of the gospel. And, 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 but, but, but it is still necessary for Christians who are truly born again, yet in theological error, whether that is theological proper about the Godhead or aspects of the Godhead in terms of pneumatology, that is the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, or even Christology, that is the doctrine of Christ. Any one of those, any one of those kinds of errors are very, very critical to the historic Christian faith. And it is necessary for every true authentic believer to have a faith that aligns with the essentials of the Christian faith. There are certain things that are non-compromising. They are non-negotiables, if you will. And, uh, and so we, wanna, we want to make sure that believers who have been taught wrong are coming into the awareness of those essentials so that their faith can align biblically as it should in every area of essential matters of faith. Uh, and, and you see, so, so it's very, very important for folks to just simply say, well, you know, well, if they're saved, why is that important? Well, truth is always important because, because truth is itself an attribute of God. And, and for anybody to even think somehow as a believer that truth is not important, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, that kind of attitude strongly suggests a heart that has not really been really, really transformed Be because, because our affections, when we are filled with the Holy Spirit, our affections, the way we come to think and feel, our attitude towards biblical truth is aligned with the way God feels about it. And, and, and so for anybody to have an attitude that truth is not important, well, that's one of them things like what Paul says that we want to, uh, uh, we want to, uh, you know, really check our faith, take inventory of, it, examine our faith and see whether, uh, you know, we, we, we're in God or not, be, because nobody should have that kind of attitude uh, about truth. All truth, biblical truth uh, is, is important. Um, all right, one last question, one last question. Um, 
<laughs> Troy, my brother, Pastor Troy says, <laughs> all right. That's not a legitimate question, bro. <laughs> anybody else? Anybody else with any, any, any other questions? One more question here. All right, anybody else? All right. Just want to make sure we uh, uh, we we got. Okay, here's the last one. Melody Spence, uh, if you Baptist, okay, I think she's saying baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Um, let me see. Uh, are you saved? Or are you, or let me, are you saved? Are you have to baptize? Okay, so here's what I think you are saying, Melody. I think you are asking the question uh, if uh, a person has been baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, are they truly saved or do they need to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ? I also have a video on that about baptism. Uh, where I explain that. I'll say this in a, in a 15 second nutshell. First of all, baptism doesn't save anybody at all. Baptism is something that people who are saved do. They don't do it to be saved. They do it because they are saved. Baptism is an act of discipleship. It is an act of obedience whereby the believer becomes obedient uh, uh, to um uh, to the faith. And, and by doing so, they are not only identifying uh, themselves with Christ, they are also identifying themselves with the Father and the Holy Spirit, who, who worked, whose work was integral in their salvation. And additionally, they are also, by baptism, identifying themselves with their local community of faith. Because all believers share something in common. We are all born of the same spirit and we have all been baptized uh, as, uh, as a part of the redeemed faith community. We shared that. that is the, those are some of the things that unite us together. Uh, but in terms of formula, Matthew 28, 19 is an authentic biblical formula for baptism, um, being baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit were the very instructions of Jesus that has not been changed. There was no secret meaning that the apostles later understood after Pentecost. No, it means exactly that. It means to be baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In the book of Acts, every time you see the phrase et to onoma, in the name of, in the name of, uh, Jesus Christos, eto enoma Jesus Christos, that was not speaking of a formula, that was speaking of the authority uh, of Jesus, people healed by the authority, folks were healed by the authority of Jesus, they prayed by the authority of Jesus, miracles were performed, so all of that speaks to the authority of Jesus, not to some uh, baptismal formula, on that unless you do it that way, uh, as some Pentecostal groups teach, then you are not saved. That also is a very, very false doctrine because it not only teaches baptismal regeneration because it attempts to suggest that baptism is essential to salvation. We've already declared uh, through various texts of scripture, especially Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Baptism is not part uh, of that equation. Baptism is what believers do because they are saved, but not in order to be saved. And so I hope that encourages you. And um, um, if you are truly a believer, uh, you ought to be baptized. That doesn't mean that it's not necessary. It is in fact necessary, but it doesn't save you. It doesn't save you. Somebody would say, well, well, if it doesn't save you, why would you do it? Because you've been commanded to do it. And if you're a true disciple, you don't come into the kingdom making your own rules up. You do exactly what you've been instructed to do. And as part of being born again, one of the fruit, one of the evidences of that is obedience. 
faith and obedience. And so every true authentic believer having the ability to will be baptized because it is necessary to, but not because it is necessary to be saved. They are already in the believing community. They are already saved, you see. So, 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 you know, that's an example of some things that we've got to unlearn. Um, we've got to really unlearn in order to really be in, in order to really embrace uh, the biblical, uh, the biblical gospel. So uh, please share this, um, share this video. Um, I hope that it really uh, clarifies some things. Um, start some discussions on your page about it. Uh, you know, I, I love to see the conversation continue. And, and of course, as you see other people posting that video uh, and, you know, and that whole, this is how I got it kind of stuff. Uh, take an opportunity in love, in love uh, to, um, you know, correct them on that and share with them. Hey, could, you know, if, if you would allow me, uh, could I share with you why that very notion of this is how I got it is wrong and, and then explain it to them in love, you see. So, uh, all right, God bless you. Thank God for all of you uh, who um, were on tonight. And uh, please, again, share this video, um, share it on your page, share it with other people uh, via inbox or whatever. But uh, give me some feedback. I'd love to know uh, what you thought. Uh, and um, uh, if you have any other questions or whatever, uh, put it in the uh, comment section. And uh, sometime later, as I go through the comment section, I'll see those questions and I'll try to answer them uh, to the best of my ability. But uh, God bless you again. Thank God for all of you uh, who have joined uh, this discussion in Jesus' name.